Hi, welcome to, to the first uh, post-summer NGI talk. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Nina and I work as a marketing specialist uh, covering the field of the NGI community. Today we have uh, Suda Yante. Sorry if my pronunciation Jante. is okay. Yante. J is Yante. Yeah. Okay, Yante. Uh, with us, who will be speaking about the career piv uh, pivot to digital twins in 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 COVID times. Suda, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for for joining us. Um, so Sula is the CEO of the IoTDisruption.com and the globally recognized leader at the junction of uh, Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Vehicles. She brings 20 years of digital transformation experience from building organizations, sh shaping uh, new technology ecosystems, um, mentoring leaders at uh, eBay, PayPal and Hardcourt. She also teaches uh, Internet of Things uh, business and autonomous vehicle business courses at the Stanford Studies and driverlessworldschool.com. Uh, she also advises innovation professionals, a board of directors and city leaders on the future of uh, transportation and disruption of smart mobility in many industries and regions to get ready for, for the autonomous vehicles that, um, that are getting closer to us. Uh, she's also the uh, author of the few book titles, such as 2030, The Driverless World, about the junction of, of the autonomous cars and cognitive uh, Internet of Things, and three more books of the Internet of Things. She's also a champion for the STEM programs, and this is my favorite part, the Girls Who Code, uh, and she hosts the mentor programs for, for the kids. She has been a venture, venture mentor at the MIT, and the director at uh, Bay Area at the Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Google Meetup. As a respected technology futurist, she actively uh, contributes to Tech Church, uh, Tech Target, Mashable, Venture Beat, Huffington Post, and, and many more. She serves as the chair of the Strategic Advisory um, at the at the Barcelona Technology School and as an ambassador for the Funding Box NGI community and the Impact Connected Car community. Uh, so she has an, an, an obvious passion for influencing the, the impact of the um, artificial intelligence on society. So today, uh, Suda will introduce the concept of the digital twins, which may be explained as a digital replica of a physical thing, and that digital applica replica can be manipulated to, to foresee what is going to happen even before it happens. Uh, this concept has become very important and critical in, in these strange, strange times that, that we're living in 2020 in this COVID times, when being able to predict what people will want to buy or, or who they will vote for could be really, of, really essential. Uh, so please free, feel free to, to raise your questions in the chat. Uh, Suda will be answering them along the way, I believe, or raise your hands so, so we can hear you, of course. Uh, Suda, um, thank you very much for, for being with us today and uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours now. Thank you so much, Nina. This was such an amazing intro. It just walked through my whole life and you did a fantastic job explaining what is a digital twin. So <laughs> I'm very excited to be here and I'm hoping that we would have a lot of conversation. I know that I'm not there in person and this is, you know, using one more window. Um, I don't know how many other meetings you had in multiple windows uh, through the day. This is my first one because it's morning for me. Uh, I'm joining you from uh, Silicon Valley from California here. And so I'm hoping that you will chat away and being a teacher, I don't mind interrupts. I don't mind people challenging me. It's part of the fun of teaching and learning together. So I hope we'll have fun in the next 30, 40 minutes till Nina signals me that I'm done. Okay. So I'm going to share my, my screen in a minute. One second.
So how many of you here already know that uh, uh, know about digital twins? It's kind of a redundant topic for you. Or you actually work with digital twin. So you can say, um, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, uh, what level to place this presentation at. So I don't want it to be that uh, I'm just going to be um, talking about uh, some basic stuff while we could be doing more interesting things. Yeah. Okay. So do you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, digital twin is a vast topic and I'm going to focus specifically on career pivots, which is my favorite topic because in everything I do, I find that over um, 25 uh, years of working in technology industry, people like you who are interested in new technologies, who have uh, opinions about how something should not be built, how it should help somebody, how it should be designed, uh, are the people who are going to be uh, creating companies, working in jobs to actually shape that. And so, I find that more fulfilling to have that conversation, mentor my students and help uh, contribute to shaping new technology ecosystems. And especially we are in COVID times. So let's talk about career pivot to digital twins in COVID times. Okay, what if a dam could tell me that it is going to break in the next month? I could be prepared for it. Or what if your doctor could see what your heart health is going to be five years from now or what if your house could actually show it being built day by day what would it look like before you bought a piece of land you're thinking oh i like this property area i want to move here and i look at this piece of land and you know the builder says here's a uh, uh, glorious picture of what the house is going to look like but what if you could see the foundation being laid the next step being built wiring being done every step of it you usually see it when you do home improvement inside your house but what if you could see it outside it is all something that we are talking about the future and as a technology futurist i'm always interested in the future but what if we could be here today and see the future coming together. What if we could actually manipulate that future? What if we had influence to change it every step of the way? So that is what a digital twin is going to give us. So welcome to the world of digital twins, or should I say cognitive digital twins? I wouldn't go far to say cognitive digital twins. So I'm going to talk about digital twins today. And you got such a glorious introduction to me. I'm Sudha Jamte, my J in my name is not silent. I'm CEO of IoT Disruptions. And I come with a mix of academic, operational work experience and strategic experience. And I do a variety of different things. And that has helped shape how I think about looking at new technologies as they are evolving. Be very skeptical about some path they are taking. Be very excited about gaps to innovate. So I'm always attracted to uh, complexity and chaos, which is what new ecosystems are. And in there, it's a very creative process. So I hope you will join me in understanding the power of digital twins and what you can do to move your career to that space in variety of different industries. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to tell you what is digital twin. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that cognitive digital twin, but I'm not going to go too much in there. And then I'm going to talk about various different industries that's that's impacted and then where are the jobs so one of the things i have learned in my life as i get excited about new technologies i got very excited about the internet i got excited about uh, social mobile local various different technologies and then in my last corporate job i worked at uh, ebay heading mobile analytics and what is called growth which is about optimizing the customer experience on the product to create engagement to create growth and you know get people to shop and buy a lot of things and one day it hit me why am i actually doing this to make people shop so much while they could be doing more interesting things with connected technologies so the one common theme i have seen with every time i got excited about a new wave of technology is that 
the technology wave that stays on creates jobs not just transient jobs for the technologists and hire more engineers but it goes past that to to create real jobs that stay and build economies and so that is what i want to focus and i'm going to share my insight on how you can pivot your career to it okay so as a first step what i thought is we should look at some digital twins what is the point of just talking about digital twins and saying hey it's a it's a digital replica of a physical asset which nina summarized very nicely for us i am going to show you a video which is not mine but bear with me okay okay hope you're able to see my screen you see able to see it now even when i do it in full are you able to see my full screen yes okay yes. cool okay so digital twin has been used the term is being used by many many companies and there are a lot of different uh, uh, people who are very skeptical about the term also so i invite you to look at what i'm going to show and share today in perspective to say okay what is the value here and what do you want to do with it what do you not want to do with it and ge actually built the the first famous digital twin uh, uh, platform called predix and they were not the ones who actually invented digital twins but the concept of digital twins they tried to create a technology platform for the enterprise with that and again in all my work i do not endorse any brand so any brand i mention or any technology i mention is an example and ge has done this explanation much better than anybody else so that's why you're seeing the ge example here but i i'm not affiliated with anybody okay i'm not going to show you a 14 minutes video we're going to see a couple minutes it's one thing to see that you saw the physical asset i think it's a turbine and then to see the digital twin there, right? But then it's a beautiful presentation. I think this is from 2017. Can to speed up. Causing damage to my HP radar. A change in my mission is causing damage to my HP turbine rotor. Okay, twin, help me understand the problem. What's your operating profile? In past six months, my number of cold starts is four, my number of warm starts is eight, my number of hot starts is 39. The number of start-stop cycles has increased by 27.5%. Twin, tell me about your rotor damage. My damage rate has increased by 4.0 times over last six months. If this continues, I would lose 69.9% of my useful life. Twin. Give me options for mitigating that rotor damage. Based on weather forecasts, historical data, fuel cost, electricity pricing in my present condition, I have two options for you to optimize operations. Option one is to manually slow down my startup ramp rate so that you can reduce the wear on my rotor. Option two is to download the Opflex app and apply stress controls to minimize wear and reduce fuel consumption too. Twin. Give me the factors you use to calculate option two. I used my past 15 years of historical data, fleet learning from 125 other D11 steam turbines like me, and 58,965 simulation runs to get this recommendation. I'm 95% confident of my assumptions. Twin, I need a financial perspective. Tell me about the numbers. The numbers look good. We can reduce stress by 25%, which brings the damage rate back to normal range. Startup fuel cost will go down by 40% and startup time will be cut by 50%. You will also avoid $12 million by preventing an unplanned outage. Twin, okay. I select option two. Let's do it. Okay. I'm initiating option two, which is flex start. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Okay. So that is um, 
Colin Paris. I'm trying to get back. It can stop, won't it? It's got a life of its own now. Okay, I'm back, people. Okay, so this video that I showed is from um, the Colin Paris from GE, and this was his live demo that he did. So I hope it gave you a feel for uh, what a digital replica of a physical asset, in this case, the turbine, looks like. And I want to unpack some of the interesting observations from there. One is, obviously, he was talking to the digital twin. I don't think it's, it's common, even in any of the tech platforms that they promise, that you can talk to the digital twin. You would get a visualization in some kind of graphs. And I posted this uh, video under Driverless World School, uh, which is where I teach online classes about autonomous vehicle, business of data, uh, AI, and the like. And in there, there is one section, uh, one, uh, it's called a course, it's called uh, Career Pivot, which is a free one, where you don't need to sign up, you should be able to go see this uh, particular video, and, you know, a lot of uh, resources, okay. Uh, thanks to Colin Paris, credit where credit is due. He was the one who used to shout the presentation. So you saw what is a digital twin? It's a digital replica of a physical asset. So now tell me what data can make into a digital mint? What data can you take to make into a digital twin? Let's look at the picture on the left. That's me holding some kind of funky robo-like thing. And I'm standing, I think, in some kind of expo area in a conference. Now, um, what do you see in this picture? There's a lot of data in this picture. So that's a clue. Um, what kind of digital twin would you be able to make from this picture? I want to see uh, your, uh, your uh, suggestions, ideas, and you can chat your answers here. And tell me what can you make a digital twin of? So I showed you that uh, G took the, Colin Paris took a turbine and created a digital twin. Uh, from this picture, if you were to say, look at this and, and say, okay, I'm going to make a digital twin, what would you be able to make a digital twin of? Give me your, your thoughts, ideas. And by the way, no answer is the right answer because this is kind of exploratory to understand the possibilities and limits of digital twins. So any takers? I'm going to ask Nina to answer my questions if other people are going to be quiet because she did such a good explanation of digital twin. Um, you think? I'm thinking, <laughs> but I'm 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 doubting <laughs> this time. <laughs> so um, we spoke about the turbine. So one obvious one is the robot there, right? It's a it's more a telepresence device. What you see there, it looks like a robotic uh, head, but it has a little camera up there. So it's a telepresence device. So we could make a digital twin of that, can't we? So that's a physical thing, and we could make a digital uh, replica of it and find out does it have wear and tear? Uh, is the, the wheel moving smoothly? Is it, you know, aging? You know, that kind of thing, exactly like what we did. What else do you think we can make a digital twin of? I want to go look at the participants to see who's here. So tell me, tell me your thoughts and it doesn't have to be a right or wrong answer, guys. Um, what else do you think we can make a digital twin of? Because that is going, to, I'm waiting for some thoughts, ideas, um, because there's a lot of possibilities with digital twins, so I don't want to get to a place where, you know, I'm just talking in a monologue. Yeah? Any, uh, what do you think we can make a digital twin of? Does anybody want to venture and chat away? Yep. Nope. Okay. So, one is that we are seeing the robot that I already said about. There could be a whole bunch of other things out there, right? There are tables, 
uh, there's a whole setup up there. There's a whole environment out there. So if you think about it, when we say we create a digital replica, we are actually putting kind of some kind of sensors and then collecting the data from the sensors. That's what we saw in the turbine example. And the sensor can say, this is the temperature, this is the moisture level, this is the air quality. Um, it can say all kinds of things. And based on that, you could collect a bunch of data and create a replica of the environment. So this could be the conference virtual, uh, it could be the virtual booth area that can be created from the physical booth area. So especially nowadays, when everything is online and we're doing all our conferences online, how about if we had actually created a digital twin of our previous conferences that we loved or the conference organizers had them going? And they say, okay, this optimal setup was perfect. People loved it. There was better engagement and they could create a digital replica of that. And why would you create a digital replica of an environment? I could do that for my office. I could do that for any building. I could do that for a mall, for a cinema theater, for an airport, any kind of environment, right? Why would I want to create a digital replica of an environment? What is in there? What is, how is it useful for me? So I just saw somebody new joined in. We're talking about digital twins, which is creating a digital replica of a physical asset. And in here, I'm showing this picture on the left with me holding this uh, telepresence robotic looking thing uh, in, a, in a conference setting. Oh, more people are coming in, welcome. So um, my question is, what can I make a digital twin of? And one is I can take the robotic thing and make a digital twin of that. I can take the environment and make a digital twin of that. Um, what else can I make a digital twin? So that was my question. And while I'm waiting for you to think about it, and again, no answer is a wrong answer because the world is the limit. You can make a digital twin of anything. I'm just asking you suggestions. I'm not gonna ask you to make the twin. And this is specifically for those of you who are joining new. We are going to be focusing on career pivot to this exciting area of digital twin. Okay, so when I take the digital twin means I'm collecting a lot of sensor data and replicating an environment. Think about this. So there's a office setup and we had a certain temperature, certain uh, humidity, certain lighting comes at different times of the day. That's what we have in our offices. And now I'm not going to my office. I'm not visited Stanford where I teach. Uh, I haven't gone there since March. And so when you create the environment back for us to go back, say with social distancing. It would be helpful if I already had the environment setting and I would say, okay, I don't need this lighting here. I don't need this kind of uh, uh, heat setup. You know, I could do, uh, I could manipulate that information for different goals. I could say, I'm going to make the environment more energy efficient than it was before. I'm going to make it more secure that people can't just come in and leave from 10 different entrances because we want to manage social distancing. So we might have different goals based on that we can manipulate the data. And in the end, the data is going to be in some form of visual visualization or some graphs that you can manage. There is a third important digital twin that is possible from this picture. What do you think it is? I'm sure you have some idea of what all I can make digital twins of. I can make out of the poster up the back. I can make the, the computer behind me in one of the tables. Uh, it could be for the whole building, but there is one thing that is sensational that I can make a digital twin of. So I can make a digital twin of the physical thing, which is the computers and the robots and the like. I can make it of the environment. I told you about that. What do you think is the third thing that I can make a digital replica of? And the clue is in the questions I asked in the beginning. I said, what if the dam can tell me it's going to break and flood my neighborhood five months down the line? Or what if I can see a building being constructed? That's the environment uh, digital twin, right? And then I said about healthcare. What if my heart can tell me what it is going to be like? five years from now. It can uh, look at- Kelly is asking yourself. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Kelly. So 
here I am, can make a digital twin of me. That's where it's, it's a double-edged edged sword because all technology is always sold as something beautiful, useful, and say, okay, now I don't know what my heart health is looking like. This picture is from many years back. I don't look like this. I'm sitting at home. I'm not exercising as much. So it would look at my historic health. It would look at my vitals. And then as a digital twin, it can collect more data and then it can build some extrapolation. If you see in the GE example, um, uh, Mr. Paris was asking, so what is going to happen if I don't do this? And it said, oh, this part will deteriorate, right? And it will lose its, li lose its lifetime value uh, over so much time period. And so the same thing could happen to us. I'm not exercising and I'm sitting and I'm just looking, collecting my data about my body. And then it could say, okay, you're not going to be, you're going to be in trouble and you need to get up and exercise. So it might say what my heart health is. And then the, the remedy could be, yes, you exercise and you cut down on your diet or do something, right? So, so far, so good. That looks like a good use case, right? But, the one I'm not going to go too much in, but I want everybody going into digital twin to be aware of is the tracking of a person does not stop just at their biometrics. As long as it's our biometrics, it's fine. But what if it starts tracking that same data, but it creates a digital twin of my behavior and says, what does she like? What does she not like? What are her moods like? Is she smiling? Is she really smiling or she's really mad and just putting on a smile? And if people can start actually understanding another person and create a digital replica of that person, then it gets into a dangerous zone into privacy violation. Unfortunately, in US, we don't have much privacy um, protection for our individual data, uh, like we have GDPR in, in Europe, and we have equivalent of GDPR evolving in, uh, in uh, Latin America that I've seen. So then it gets into this area where the social networks can look at everything that we like or share, who are we connected to, and start manipulating us. And so I just want to leave it at that. So the digital twin, so if you want to get into this exciting field of digital twin, I want you to go in with caution and be aware that when you build something, think about the, the good use case of how you're going to use it or whether it can be misused in some way and, and make sure that you build checks and balances for it. So it could be the physical asset. It could be a process of how we do things in a company. It could be the environment, and then it could be the, the person, okay? So now let's add AI to the digital twin. If you remember in the beginning, I said, I'm going to tell you about digital twin. And then I had this code out saying, you know, it's not cognitive digital twin. A cognitive digital twin is when you add AI to the digital twin. So you have all the data about the environment, about the process, about the person, about uh, physical assets, and then you add AI to it. And what does AI do? AI does predictions. It will look at data, it will look pa for patterns, and then it will do predictions. So am I sharing here, guys? Are you able to see my sharing? Yeah, okay. So what can AI do? So Dr. Uh, Hamad El Adil is the person who coined the word cognitive digital twin. And you should look him up on, uh, on LinkedIn. He talks about this area. He has worked with GE in the early stages while they were building this out. So he's very passionate about this whole cost concept of cognitive digital twins. And for the purpose of a career pivot discussion, I would say a cognitive digital twin adds AI to the digital twin, which means you can do machine learning, you can do some prediction, like we saw in the GE example. Is this part going to fail? Is the heart health going to get to a, a bad place? Do we need to take some action? So the AI can do some prediction. That's where I want to stop it. But where Dr. Adil takes it is he says, the digital twin should not be just a 
a CAN model of whatever we are seeing in a physical asset, which is essentially, you know, put IoT sensors and then send that to the cloud and then create a copy and then call it a digital twin. He, for him, a cognitive digital twin is actually learning enough as an AI and develop some kind of cognition or intelligence. So it is going to be able to not just answer our questions for which we expect a good or bad outcome, but it can actually warn us about things that is possible. It can think about things. And that is the cognitive digital twin in a true sense. So again, it can be a very controversial topic. Unless somebody has a question about it, I'm not going to go there. Again, I want you to be aware, especially if you say, I'm going to work on digital twins, and you're expected to use AI in some form because you can manipulate the data uh, faster, make some predictions. That is where the exciting possibilities are. But then you might get pulled into this discussion about cognitive digital twins, whether it's going to, the AI is going to get cognition. I try not to go there because I try to stay grounded saying what we have today in terms of AI, it's not possible. But then when you see, you know, uh, when you see uh, a, a, a brain computer and data from our brain collected and a digital twin created of that, then it, it creates alarms of this cognition and where we would go with it. I would rather be more alarmed about a human being misusing that information even before we get to the AI that can develop cognition. So the, and the state of AI is nowhere near where AI can get cognition today, but I would just want you, especially if you're going to work with behavioral data, which happens in, uh, uh, in retail a lot. And if you're going to sell me something and say, um, I see your buying pattern and I would like to sell you this other item as a best match algorithm, that's one thing. But if you try to understand my moods and say, okay, now she's actually feeling low, so I think she's going to buy shoes, then that's a problem. So I want you to be aware that you can take any data, create a digital replica, send it to the cloud, manipulate that, create visualization, and based on that, ask questions and make predictions. So far, so good. When it crosses the line where it is an ethical line or whether it's a privacy boundary, I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, I want to pause um, and just, I have another slide just saying, you know, when I drew the word machine learning, uh, all kind of data I and mean, all kind of algorithms in, in AI is basically taking large feeds of data and it is training some kind of model to create some kind of pattern. And then based on that, it's going to answer a question and say, okay, so basically it is saying, does this data point belong in this pattern that we formed or is it an anomaly? And so is that a behavior the user is going to say, if I show them shoes, are they going to buy shoes? If I see the, uh, the turbine data, uh, is it normative data or is there something different? And I see that it is going to break. So that's what the machine learning or AI is essentially going to do. So I just thought I'll add a visual for that. Okay, so before we go to the next phase of this discussion, so we spoke about, we saw an example of a digital twin, which is a digital replica of a physical asset. And then we spoke about uh, what is possible to create as a digital twin, and then adding AI to the digital twin. So I want to pause and see if you have questions. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to move forward. OK. So I would say a cognitive digital twin is not just about data and copying data and sending it to the cloud. It is about the business of data. What I mean by that is when you work in a real company and you're trying to add sensors to an existing asset, it could be, let's take my microwave or toaster or my TV. Uh, if you, if you are, or, or um, uh, let me give you a useful asset, which is my uh, pressure monitor. My pressure monitor is from this company called Omran, and I had a previous one, 
And then now I have one which is connected and it talks to Bluetooth, talks to an app and it looks for patterns. So it's not just collecting my blood pressure, but it looks for a historic pattern and it, it can develop intelligence. It does not have intelligence. It has the potential to level up intelligence. So when you do this in a, in a large company setting, you actually have to operationalize you have to get the data you have to get the data moving to the cloud you have to actually have access to the data because within companies you will have different departments have different access to data you might not have access to all the historic data so there's an operational aspect to the business even appreciating the value of the data so one of the things you would find if you try to go into the job mode with this is very unreasonable expectation that you would you'd be able to take something and then look for patterns and uh, look for falls, look for uh, predictions and, and and create that business outcome. So there is a lot of what you can bring from your existing experience, working in industry, in your industry. And that, that's what I want you to remember when we talk about uh, the business twin as a business of data. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears. So what is the common problem that all of us in the world play, face because of COVID? Yes, one is obviously the COVID virus and the health hazard. But other than that, now that we have to do be on lockdown or we have to do shelter in place or uh, we are doing social distancing and coming out slowly uh, or we are doing a lot of these remote stuff. What is it? I think it's kind of become a common thread that connects all of us. Here I am sitting in California and I'm talking to you in Europe and you're coming from various parts of different countries in Europe. Um, so what is the common thing that connects all of us? What is the common problem we all face? This must be an easy one. What is because you're all sitting at home and trying to log in and dial in. So what is the common problem we face that we need solution for? As soon as I'm sitting at home and I cannot go out and drive, what's the one thing? Let me give you one clue, food, right? We all want food. We might do a takeout. We might get food. We might go uh, get groceries from the the store. Now everything is limited. Everything is become a hassle. So get and then uh, initially I remember when we got this whole lockdown in California, we had a hassle with getting certain things and not getting certain things because our supply chain was impacted. So if somebody created a digital twin of our behavior of how we were shopping, suddenly that all went got tossed out because suddenly we are buying a lot of different things and ordering them. And uh, we are ordering certain things and not ordering certain things. So food is a common problem the whole world has. What else would you say? Chat away guys, tell me your suggestion. What else do you think? You're uh, sitting at home in COVID, um, lockdown, not able to move around. What other problems do we have? We all want food. What else do we want? That's common that I have the same problem. You have the same problem wherever we are in the country, wherever we are in the world. I'm going to wait for some seconds to see whether somebody wants to add something. Now you've been so quiet. Suddenly it feels like I'm going to be the first person to type on the chat. So. I'm going to add here food. There's a question, uh, water. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was thinking of a, of a social contact, but it, that might not be the thing. That you're okay, searching. okay, actually that's a very good one. Oh, same thing. Sorry, what is, yeah, social contact is a very good one. Well, so, uh, well, yeah. I think that I, I wrote companionship or conversation. I think that's uh, yeah, yeah. Thing. I we get isolated, so we want some form of social contact and companionship, and uh, and if we miss that, it's going to affect our well-being, our mental health. So I would call that as as one one topic. Yeah. So food, water. So that's good. So um, food. We all want safe and clean water. We want uh, access to good healthcare um and we want education right so we want i find that more more of you like why are you here trying to learn a new topic on digital twins there's a sudden hunger uh, for people to learn new things to and for 
uh, for students, for kids to get education, you know, sitting on a Zoom uh, session and doing uh, classes is not the same as being in a social setting in a school and learning. And so, but at a fundamental level, this these are at least the four things. And thank you for adding that the social contact or, you know, um, escape from isolation is what I would call it, number five. So I would say where the job, so where are the digital twins creating the jobs is where it can solve for our fundamental problems in COVID times. We want safe food, we want safe water, we want, so there's a lot of food delivery. Uh, there is a lot of digital twins you can create of, of uh, water plants. So that's where the, the jobs are in every possible industry and different kind of roles. If you remember, I said you create a digital replica. That means you add sensors, you collect data, you move the data to the cloud, you manage the data in the cloud, you manipulate the data, some kind of uh, analysis of the data, you get visualization of the data, you make predictions from the data. Finally, you have to talk to humans. So you have to design and you create human-centered design with that data. So like uh, if the dam near my place is going to break down and some smart AI is, is saying, oh my God, it's going to break down. It won't even say, oh my God, it will just say it is going to break down at this hour, right? And it, uh, I need an application interface, a human interface to think about who are the impacted people? How do we communicate to them? Do we send them a notification on the mobile phone, which we get a lot for any kind of wildfire or earthquake, we get notifications on a phone which is a system app that has been set up. But not everybody might have access to the phone. So then they usually do the next thing of call on the phone um, if they don't have access to the phone. So how are you going to make sure that everybody get equal access to safety when a system predicts that something is going to break? That needs a human element. So product managers, data architects, business development managers who do partnerships, and you, and so all the different roles are needed to build this thing. And then specifically today, when we are in, uh, in a lockdown and keeping safe distance uh, with COVID, computer vision has become very, very powerful. So there are cameras everywhere. The cameras take pictures and from the pictures, you can actually look for patterns. It is used in agriculture to see whether a plant is growing. Uh, it is used in social distancing to see whether people are keeping social distance, which is kind of creepy, uh, creeping into the whole privacy area. Uh, there's a whole bunch. And the one I was telling you about construction, whether you can see your house construction happening, that is possible because the cameras watch oh, and, and it's, a, it's a time series of that same information watching the house being constructed. That's what you would see as a digital twin. So cameras are very powerful and computer vision using cameras is, is something that is picking up big time. Uh, in the world of uh, digital twins. So so I, now I want to give you a bunch of examples. Uh, I can, I'm gonna zip through uh, four or five examples of what is happening in the world I am seeing, uh, especially with COVID, various different applications. Um, so that should give you an idea of industries and type of jobs and the like. But if you don't want to go deeper into this and want to stop and ask me questions, I'm open for that too. So uh, I teach about autonomous vehicles and this is all about robot taxis and cool stuff. And then you know what we are doing? We are using an autonomous vehicle to transport test kits, COVID test kits, because we should not have humans transporting that, right? And so that is what this particular vehicle is doing in uh, Mayo Clinic. It's doing in two states, I think in Florida and in Arizona. Um, and then this is a bunch of sensors. We had wildfires and you know air quality went down. It was super scary. Uh, where I live is where this area is. And this is actually showing where the fires are and what the air quality is from the sensors. Again, we could build digital twins of this, right? This is not a digital twin. It is just live stream of data that is collected. They could build predictions and say, I see the fire here and the fire is the, the, the fire is the air is wind is blowing in this direction and so the air quality is going to get worse. In fact, they do send us some prediction and say today's air quality is this, tomorrow it's going to be better or worse. They do warn us. So uh, that could be built into a complete digital twin and they could ask us to evacuate before it's too late. Um, 
And the one area that I teach related to connected vehicles is one thing that we don't even think about, that every single car and bus and uh, truck these days comes as a connected device. What do I mean by connected device? It comes with a SIM card. They don't tell us like a phone uh, that it has a SIM card, but the makers, the OEMs, the manufacturers have that information and they collect data from the vehicle so they can see how whether it is driving uh, with fuel efficiency or the drivers uh, driving the vehicle safely is some part uh, is if all the parts working fine so all of that is actually one of the topics that i teach in this business of av data course on uh, driverless world school so um, that is all done by digital twin okay uh, there's a company called Intangles that I'm a big fan of because it's a startup and they build digital twins for uh, the topic that I was talking about with the vehicles. And uh, here I'm showing you a school bus just to give you an idea, you know, all the different pieces that goes in, in making this telematics, right? Uh, when I said we can connect data, data seems very abstract, right? But this is how you would actually have a bus that is connected. It, and it will share its GPS location as one of the data points. It will share a whole bunch of information about the bus, the health of the bus. And based on that, you could you could create a digital twin and that's happening already in, in Sweden. Um, and coming back to COVID and one of our primary need of healthcare, uh, this is happening around the world, but this is an example from a company uh, from Argentina. And the name of the companies are here. Again, I, as I said, I have no affiliation with any brand or any company. I'm just looking for good examples. And this is something where we have x-rays are all digitized. And so the doctor gets to see the x-ray remotely. Um, and they are, the collection of x-rays are also digital. And then there could be some computer vision done based on that they could see for patterns to see you know whether there is COVID or anything else that they need to create alert and, and get help for the person. So uh, that is teleradiology that is being done again because of COVID. Uh, this is uh, a company I found in Chile. And again, it is there in multiple places too. Uh, called remote waters, which is about the safe water. So the water purification that is happening. And this particular company is doing this with zero CO2 emission, and they have this autonomous operations and monitoring, and it ad adapts to various different, and it has solar. So it is, you know, off, it's totally off the grid. And so uh, that is a water uh, purifier. Uh, this is another thing that is again being done around the world, but I have an example from a company from Bolivia, uh, which is about um, thermography using infrared. And so as we are going back to work and keeping social distance, it is actually looking at people. It's obviously protecting their privacy and blurring out the faces, but then it is actually checking the temperature using infrared as people come in and say, here it's in Celsius, you know, different temperature and say this person is at 39, this looks like an alert. And it says how many people have come inside and how many alerts and you can set the threshold and the like, and it's a whole application. If you think about it, you could be working in the area of the technology of the infrared, the thermography of the computer vision or creating the application interface so that it is human and you're not scaring people and not stepping on their privacy. Um, this is an interesting one from uh, city of uh, Amsterdam. They, uh, they are using this for uh, looking at graffiti in the walls. It, they're looking at garbage uh, uh, detection uh, along the city. They have this object detection kit called ODK. Um, and and, and um, ODK.ai is where you can go and find out. The city of Amsterdam has this. All they're doing is um, they are taking the city vehicles and they're adding cameras and it is looking at the side uh, sidewalks on both sides collecting data uh, data in this case is images and then looking at that images to say okay there is garbage here and then they are using computer vision to organize it and say this is <clears throat> this is the paper trash this is plastic this needs pickup and they're they're doing that in fact they have an option where citizens can uh, you know residents in amsterdam can can sign up and use their camera and collect more information while you're driving around there also. 
the other option is if you're looking to career pivot and move into the space and you bring experience in this then um, happy to talk to you and, and make an introduction because they have a lot of internships and uh, opportunities as they are working with people to do multiple uh, smart city initiatives using city data. Uh, this is an AV simulation in uh, Catalonia Living Lab. Uh, they have a whole uh, simulation of uh, autonomous vehicles in, uh, in a lab setting. It's a road setting with a lab where they collect information and then they kind of build a digital twin to extend that to various different kind of uh, road environments, uh, rain and uh, various uh, weather patterns. So you, can't, you don't have to run the autonomous vehicle in all the different situations. You can run a simulation and that is a complete digital twin. It's a full cognitive digital twin. So with that, again, I want to pause and see whether you have any questions. Uh, was there any surprise uh, with any of the examples I showed you of digital twins? Um, if I spend more time, I'm sure we can find, you know, one in your country. So uh, one thing I want to offer you is as you're listening to this, if you're new to this topic or you think that it was not relevant to you and suddenly you, you know, feel like, okay, this could be something I might be interested, talk to me and connect with me. I'm here on uh, NGI uh, and you can connect with me from there from and I'm happy to, I promise I will talk to each one of you if you ping me, which is give me a context where you found me from, so uh, what you're talking about. And uh, I will help you if you're thinking about transferring your skills or moving into this area. So how do you pivot? You bring the transferable skills. Like I said, so many different types of jobs are needed. There's not one person sitting and building digital twins. So bring your transferable skills. Uh, I'm getting to the end of my presentation. So I want to just give you my recommendation of what I give my students is you pick one technology and learn its applications or use case. Do you feel excited about computer vision? Do you feel excited about solving problems for the city? Do you feel excited about clean water or uh, food delivery? Just pick an area that you're passionate about and and then go deeper and then you can learn more applications so i have this career pivot q a speaker series that i do uh, uh with my team on uh, wednesdays uh i think it is at uh, 18 hour uh, cest and uh, you can come if it makes sense for you to join live otherwise come back look at the videos later and it's it's free and we have people from around the globe from every time zone we don't have too many people from asia because of the timing but we have people from Latin America, from US, from uh, America in general, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, countries from Europe. So pick any technology or an application area that's interesting. Go deeper, find out who's doing what, what are their issues. Anything you see on surface doesn't mean it's perfect because when you see the marketing material, somebody's doing a good job in marketing saying it's perfect, but it's not. So see what are the issues. Can you bring something from your experience? The most important thing is understand what the ecosystem looks like. What are the terminologies they use? Who are the companies? Who are the partners? Think about where you can help. Like you're listening to Digital Twins and we are talking about different industries today. And then I believe in the end, you need to do some kind of project to just get your own confidence to do build a showcase. So this is how I would say as the four paths. So talk to me. And then uh, I don't know, people have been relatively quiet, so I don't know where you're coming from. But uh, if you are a Spanish speaking person, uh, I have a cognitive IoT mini course, uh, which talks about variety of different applications. And it's I literally in an hour, you can finish the course. And here's the bit.ly link for it. Um, talk was recorded, will be posted in NGI community. You can follow up with the discussion. Thank you, Nina. So here is a Spanish course. It's literally one hour. It's free. You can sign up and uh, you can you don't need you won't get spammy emails from us or anything. Uh, this is again on driverless world school. And here is the bit.ly uh, cognitive IoT free course. So try that if that's a Spanish people, you know, speaking uh, population, uh, if that's preferable for you. Otherwise, join the career pivot and I'm happy to talk to you. Otherwise, I'm here and this is my intro that I did on uh, NGI a couple of days back. This is what it looks like if you look for me. Um, come talk to me and I'm here to help. With that, I'm going to wrap up 
and I'm pretty uh, public, open person. So you can connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn, or you know you can email me. I've given you my email, uh, driverlessworldschool.com, uh, and um, and I typically post the slides on SlideShare, so I'll post this one also there. But I will also know uh, send a note on uh, NGI because you have the recording there. So with that, I want to stop my sharing, and I want to see if somebody has been brave enough to ask any questions. Finally. There was a question if we can get a copy of your brilliant presentation. Okay. So yeah. as, I, as I already said that it's it's the session is recorded, so it's going to be posted along with the presentation in the NJ community. I just posted a link so you can follow up on there. OK, I also post everything on SlideShare, so I will put it on SlideShare also. And especially this one is going to be with the recording. So I would recommend go to NGI and look at it because that would be you can look at the presentation and uh, and uh, listen to my recording so that would be useful uh, if you want to go back look at any of my past work every single time i speak right i put everything uh, out on the internet so you can access that and i mean it i will find time to answer your questions and it's not okay. like 500 people here so you can yeah, look now you can speak right now if you thank want you hi welcome I, I, i'm <laughs> dying to talk to you hello <laughs> i'll keep you a lot longer and I, I wanted to know you mentioned the course that you gave that you you put on that um i don't know where to find it um i see that you put here the space finding the next ngi talks that's where we can find the rest of your talks thank you uh, for posting that um is it nina or whoever posted it nina is doing all the good work i'm just talking <laughs> nina yeah, the, I will post uh, uh, all the info that was uh, presented. Okay, you can follow up over there in the in the spaces. So there's going to be uh, an info about the course, so you can follow uh, up uh, on, on there. Where, where do I follow up again? I'm sorry. On the link that was sent in the chat. Oh, this link right here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Soon we will post over there, so you yeah, can. Yeah, and I talk was recorded and will be posted on fine uh, funding yeah. box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. And also, I just uh, added the URL for the this free course in case you want it. Uh, I don't. Where did you put that? I I can't that see. That is it. also. Oh, it's uh, in the. I will I will republish it. So that is. I don't know you why should, I can't see anything. Yes, that thank you. You should be you should be see right now. Now I see. Thank you. I guess when yeah. you. Yeah. And yeah. Please, uh, please talk to me. Um, I definitely will follow up if you're on NGI. That would be the. The most optimal way to chat with me because then we can have a conversation how do i uh, um to chat with you on ngi like it, uh, on the link that was sent earlier you mean yeah in the same link that says fundingbox.com the whole thing yeah. um you will find my profile and i believe you can connect with me and you can message me okay and i send you a linkedin request and i um actually there's a big there's a conference happening next week that i wonder if you have time to to invite to speak at to re, um, they might be, they would do them a lot of benefit, I think, if they hear you. <laughs> I'm, ha I'm happy to follow up, you know, I definitely. Uh, I, I, I will re reach out to you on, I already reached out to you on LinkedIn. I left you my phone number. I also will find you here. I'm also involved in N NGI, um, but this was amazing. I'm like, I want to make sure I don't miss any of your sessions again, thank, ever. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah. this is, a, this is a, you know new topic and you know there's a lot of jargons in there so you know it's very easy to get intimidated and feel like you know maybe i'm the one who doesn't know it so it took me some time in life to figure out that when i ask a question about something that i don't know there's more than 50 percent of the people who don't know but they're just not asking it and so now i made it a habit anything i don't know i just kind of ask so you'll see me sharing a lot of information but at the same time i'm not shy i will say does this mean this or is it the same it's connected it helps me actually learn better and uh, so okay. if you're comfortable you can do that or you can ask me one-on-one -on -one. Um, i'm happy to you know give you pointers and uh, help yeah you. i i definitely will do both but i, I most certainly would love to talk to you uh, um, also one-on-one -on -one, just so that i don't overwhelm or like before you know it then the whole thing will end up just a conversation between the two of us me <laughs> <I'm chasing. laughs> no, it's, it's totally fine 
I mean, Thank that is know. one of the things I've been teaching in at Stanford Continuing Studies, which is pro, for professional adults, and the same thing on driverlessworldschool.com, uh, which is online. Uh, and they are all people who are looking to change jobs or find new jobs, you know, people, adults, right? So that's kind of my sweet spot. So I spend uh, the most enjoyable part of my week is talking to my uh, students. Oh, as to, you know, I am, I find I am seeing an adult at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and and the thing with technology is even if you do nothing if you stay put everything changes all around you and then if you don't know it it's a, it's full of jargons and it's intimidating so i was just thinking even about myself, a geek all your life it's intimidating because you 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 have a headache one day and you're 10 years behind that's right that's right but the thing is if you if you just ignore it and it will all change again so for <laughs> me i had the, i had that experience I was working, working, then I did a startup and then my startup failed. I took a break, I took a mommy break, had my child. I said, I am out of technology, not going to do anything related to what I was doing before. Everything changed all around me. I came back and for a little while, I'm beginning to watch what is going on. It was very intimidating. And then it took me some time to kind of get my groove. Within the time it changed again. So I just could pick up the next wave and then move on. But the, I'm very passionate about helping people with career pivot because when you take a break or you enter new from another industry, it feels like you're starting afresh. But you're not a you're not a student from you know out of high school starting here because you have work experience, you have soft skills, and you would be able to transfer that and bring that in. So I'm very big on don't take a pay cut if you're moving to a new space, if you take a mommy break, you have to just figure out what are the transferable skills and you have to show, first you have to develop confidence. And, and I'm a big believer that if you're passionate about something, you'll put in the extra hour to learn that. And then you can actually do the, you know, find out how, how you bring the transferable skills, especially today, AI is very broad. A lot of things you're seeing is, is very broad across multiple industries. And so if you work in one industry, you can bring that to another industry, which would be very useful because it brings a fresh perspective that they are not thinking about. So that's my advice about, you know, uh, career pivots, exciting time to do career pivots. And it's frustrating for all of us when you have to sit remote, no social contact, sit at home and all that monotony, not able to travel, but you know, that gives you time to go learn and you if you set a goal and you say i'm going to do this project or better if you collaborate with somebody and hold each other accountable that's the best way then you know so i like to do these presentations because it forces me to go find the latest on the topic and and answer your questions i never know what you're going to ask next so it keeps me you know on a learning mode so i, I appreciate that so um thank you so very much we are a bit of uh over the time but it doesn't matter it's a very interesting talk and uh, thank you for the inspiration <laughs> and uh, if there is no any more question i just left the the, the link to your uh, profile in the ngi community so uh, all of those that want to reach you directly can can do that over there and ah, I did not know there was a straight url like that i would yes. i'll actually add that to my linkedin also that's cool yes Okay, uh, and um, that will be all for today, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you. you can follow up the, the discussion here on the link uh, that I posted, and uh, there will be a link there uh, soon in today or tomorrow, tomorrow most likely. And uh, I want to thank you, Suda, once again for, for this interesting talk. And um, uh, stay safe, everyone, and have a nice uh, rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.